Mr. Lloyd, also, I mean, some of the disruptors that were speaking about the new entrance into uh, politics, if we're talking about more than 70 political parties who are contesting all 10 elections, then speaks to the need for greater conversation around certain areas. And uh, some say that's because we also need a greater economic liberalization, uh, empowering more of the ordinary man on the streets. Your thoughts on that, and is there evidence of that in the people who are coming to the fore? And are they disrupting the existing political structures? I think they're nudging it. I don't think it's disrupting. I think after the election, we're likely to see things similar to what they were before. Uh, but I think it's a welcome thing, and people are feeling the freedom to go into different political directions. And just to, to, just to give you a very practical example of how the colonial legacy lives on in the new South Africa, uh, with our portrait of the mind, I'm afraid, is with us. I'll give you a simple example. We're involved in the Free Market Foundation with one of the biggest and poorest shanty towns or, or settlements in South Africa, Marathon and Delport in Kuruleni, or most people might know it as Germiston. And here you have the existing law for registering townships, for proclaiming land, getting title deeds, becoming owners, makes it for practical purposes impossible and illegal and forbidden for people in shanty towns to improve their own living standards. They may not do so under law. And this is the law inherited designed, the township registration law designed by the apartheid regime for leafy, rich white suburbs is now applied to poor black people all through South Africa. Uh, the Mbeki Trust, we are working with them at the moment, who are trying to lend money to rural women running small businesses. It is effectively banned, it is illegal to lend money lawfully to micro uh, credit organizations like women's groups. And we're talking here about the former First Ladies, and Nele Mbeki uh, will tell you that what they want to do to help and finance rural women is banned by finance laws which were inherited from the past and perpetuated in the new South Africa that make it essentially impossible to become a financial service provider or a financial advisor for low-income people. In fact, the Financial Services Board boasted to Parliament in 2014 that it had deregistered 14,000 financial service providers. Now, what colour do you think they were? Were there any banks or insurance companies or brokerage firms deregistered? No. It was emerging black South African financial service providers and brokers who were banned. Now, it's their consumers who are not getting services. And the law that we have now, I'm sorry to say, it's the old apartheid law which lives with us and hangs around the neck of low-income people, stops them advancing. And this is actually the travesty. Colonialism lives in the minds of people who are not getting rid of the laws that were designed to privilege white South Africans and keep black people down, such as our township laws, our building codes. Is it the fault of the failure of even the GNU of repealing some of those archaic yes. laws? Yeah. And, or is it the lack of failure in consulting within that transitional period the people who were affected, the biggest constituency, if you're talking about black rural women, for instance. I was in the anti-apartheid movement and there are pictures of me here in this very museum and I was at the Dakar conference, for example. So let me immediately get that out of the way. Uh, I used to think it was simply race. Nasty white people, black victims. I now have concluded that there was a dimension that I never appreciated in my years as an anti-apartheid activist, which is a socio-economic dimension. Once people are advanced, living in the leafy suburbs, have bank accounts, are in the middle class, they are completely alienated from the poor. They do not think about them, they do not understand them. We have liquor laws in, in South Africa, for example, which was passed, which would have made it, and smoking laws which make it technically illegal to smoke in a township like Alex, because you have to be, according to the proposed law, 10 meters from an entrance. You cannot get 10 meters from an entrance in a low-income area. These are laws written by rich people, now rich black people, it used to be rich white people, for rich areas and rich people. The trouble we face in South Africa is how do you get the current elite, progressed, wealthy 
black South Africans, like we try to get with the old white South Africans, to relate to the poor and to relieve the poor of these laws that keep them suppressed as they were under apartheid. Okay. There was obviously a time when, uh, in the past couple of years, even through its various elective conferences that the ANC uh, was speaking about a need for radical economic transformation. And uh, that is something that has been lamented by a lot of people who are looking at South Africa from a development aspect. And um, Ms. Poker spoke earlier on about FDI, and, and we often hear about these invisible faces of the markets, of investors, how uh, they would be adversely affected by that, uh, should I say, left turn, if some would call it that, that radical transformation of the economic infrastructure. Where does the Free Market Foundation stand now, given the fact that it is clear while that there has been progress, there needs to be a radical shift. Well, let's say we are in favour of radical economic transformation. Unfortunately, the people who use the term are not recommending anything radical at all. Uh, one of the things the ANC should do, for example, is have a poor person's impact assessment on every new law and policy and everyone that's already there and say, how would this affect poor people? And then they would find all their credit laws, all their town planning laws, all their building codes, all their labor laws uh, impact poor people negatively. So what you want is a very simple radical economic transformation. You want to look around the world and you look at the countries that are prospering and the countries that are stagnating, and it's very simple. Every country that is towards the socialist communist end of the international index of economic systems is poor. Every country that is towards the free market end of the internationally objectively published index has high growth and is rich. Poor countries that move towards that, like China and India and Indonesia and Rwanda and, and Mauritius and Botswana and, and Zimbabwe, for example, Im immediately start moving up towards being rich. All you've got to move is towards a market economy. If we had in South Africa a poor person's impact assessment and every new law from the new liquor laws, the new tobacco laws, the new labor laws, the new land laws, the new financial control laws, the new building codes, the new everything was said, how would this impact poor people? the law would never get through Parliament. So if you want radical economic transformation, you simply say, let's start having laws that don't oppress poor people. And virtually every law in Parliament does that. If what you're saying is true, why would there be such a growing and marked change in multilateralism? Why would there be such emphasis on governments who are seen and not to share the policies, the ideologies of the so-called Britain was the states. Well, let me just say, Africa is now the highest economic growth region in the world, sub-Saharan Africa, or what used to be called Black Africa. And the reason for that is very, very simple. Uh, most African countries are now moving towards liberal economic policies. They're privatizing and liberalizing. The ones that aren't remain poor, the ones that are are growing. Uh, but you can look all over the world, Latin America, whatever. But aren't so, there those who depend heavily on foreign aid as well? No, there's very little. None of the countries that prosper depend on foreign aid. A country like Rwanda, uh, which adopts radical economic transformation, meaning radical market economy policies, it immediately becomes so rich that it no longer qualifies for foreign aid. The same is true of Botswana, the same is true of Mauritius. So it's not rocket science, it's not difficult. You don't need an NDP. You don't need a new commission or committee. All you need to do is open the book of the index of economic systems in the world, compare the economic system with countries that are rich and countries that are poor, and then just do what the ones that are rich do. It's simple. You don't need any more commissions and inquiries and reports and, and, and NDPs and, and uh, gears or anything else. Just do what works. And what works is simple. It's easy to find. Okay. Anyone who goes for 10 minutes on the internet can find out what policies coincide with prosperity. Let's just implement them.